All these things to call for my heart Telling me that I should listen But when I cast my vision upward They try to fight for my attention They may be good But if you're My judgment's lifted. Fear abandoned, hope is here now. Hope screaming out, it's all declared. Good morning, church. Let's get excited to be here. Greet your neighbor with the love of Christ this morning. Glad you're here. Well, as you're making your way back to your seats, if you would remain standing with me as you're able, as we join together in affirming our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. 
Uh, my name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here at Covenant. I want to welcome you all to worship. If you're a guest with us, especially I want to offer a warm welcome to you. Uh, the, in, in the seat back in front of you, there are two cards. There's an I'm new card. If you are new, if you would fill out some contact information, we'd love to reach out, connect with you. The Lord has called us as a body to build a community connecting in Christ, both in our interactions here and on our interactions in the community as well. There's also a prayer card. If you have a prayer request, we would love to come alongside you in prayer. And uh, either of those cards could be put in the offering plate later in the service. If you are a guest with us, today is a special day. Uh, we have an opportunity uh, to connect with one another. We call it Next Steps Together. If you have questions about the church, uh, about the vision of the church, where we're going, and uh, what the Lord is leading us to do, if you would like to, uh, ha- to have your questions answered, uh, share your story, we would love to have that engagement. And so after worship today, we have fajitas uh, in the Summit Youth Room. And, uh, oh yeah, we'd like to eat fajitas with you too. So I uh, hope that you will join us for that. I also want to remind you that uh, last Sunday we announced we're having a Sunday drive for uh, Tomball Emergency Assistance Ministries women's personal care items. Uh, Those can be bought on the Amazon wish list or can be brought back to the church in the next week. Our women's ministry is putting those packets together and bringing them uh, to team to Tomball Emergency Assistance Ministries to bless the women clients there. Uh, also want to share with you that today is uh, the first Sunday of our uh, Boundless Capital campaign here at Covenant. Uh, the, the Lord says uh, that, that those who are led by the Spirit of God are called children of God. That's in Romans chapter 8. And, and we believe that God is leading us by a Spirit into a boundless future. Uh, that boundless future includes uh, launching some new ministry. We're going to be building some sports Uh, fields so that we can launch sports and recreation ministries here at the church. We're going to uh, be improving our uh, our digital ministries, including our live stream capacity, so that uh, we can continue uh, blessing our community through that digital ministry and outreach. And then finally, uh, we're going to be, uh, and most importantly, we're going to be paying down much of the debt of the church so that we together uh, can lean into a boundless, unconstrained future so that the church can lead where the Spirit is moving. Uh, there will be packets that will be sent out to all the members of the church. Uh, and so you should be looking early this week to receive a packet. And then later in this week, you'll receive a phone call from one of, our, one of our servants to be sure that you got the information, to answer any questions, and to pray with you. And so uh, I want you to be aware that that's taking place. On your way in this morning, if you've been with us before, you noticed that there was something different, like a beautiful masterpiece art, uh, uh, art uh, rendering was there in the commons. It says boundless. It's a hot air balloon. And there's a prompt in the bottom left corner. It says, I thank God for my church. I thank God for covenant because it's a sentence prompt. And uh, we are each invited to complete that sentence. I thank God for my church because. And... Uh, then you, uh, when you get closer, you'll see that uh, our children, our youth led the way on Wednesday, and then many folks from the 9 o'clock also have already completed that prompt. I hope that you'll take time after worship to, uh, to complete that prompt. We have some servants that will be there with Sharpies, and uh, you can uh, write your sentence there. Um, I'm going to open our, uh, our time of prayer here in just a moment with some space of silence so that you can reflect on uh, how you would complete that sentence in preparing your heart for writing it on the board later in uh, the morning. Uh, Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Gracious and loving God, we do come before you in a spirit of thanksgiving. We're thankful for uh, the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us, upon your people. We're thankful for your Holy Spirit, for the work of mission and ministry, for the fact that we don't walk alone and that we are a part of a body, uh, for your good news, for scripture. We're thankful for our sisters and brothers that, uh, that encourage us and admonish us so that we might walk faithfully after you. Lord, we thank you. We come before you uh, as a thankful people, uh, eager to praise you. And so, Lord, we we ask that that as we worship you this morning, that that you would pour out your Holy Spirit uh, as a gift for your people, uh, that your spirit would work amongst us, 
would work in us and would work through us, that we would be uh, empowered to enter into the world as your disciples, spreading your love and your grace to all we encounter. Lord, bless this time of worship. Be glorified, honored, and praised through it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church, we all know that this is a place of freedom, but this morning we are going to learn a new song together. And anytime we learn a new song, I know sometimes that makes us a little more timid. So we are going to the opposite, and I'm going to invite everybody to stand confidently as we learn a new song together. So let's stand together. As we sing it, I encourage you uh, to sing along with us. right for worship to give him all the praise let's sing the image of grace agents of healing father of unity holy and surrender and by your spirit
like you love show us how to love like you love show us how to love like you come to him with thankfulness and gratitude this morning. It's worthy of our praise. our hands in worship. Show how to throw on my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, I have nothing else before King, except for a heart singing. this song church we know that this is the part where we pump ourselves up to worship more fully and i'll be honest the nine o'clock there were some worshipers in there it was a beautiful sight to see the body of christ worshiping together let's not lose that momentum church let this room be a place of praise
of everything that we can give. And so, Lord, we choose today to give you praise. We choose today to be present, to open up our eyes, to open up our ears and our hearts. We choose to be humble. Lord, we ask for your help in that. Help us to keep our hearts open to you. Lord, we intentionally today choose to pray, choose to intercede. Knowing that Mother's Day is coming up next week, we don't want to wait until next week to lift up this prayer. But as the days approach, we, we pray for those who struggle on that day. We pray for those who are grieving, that he would be their comfort. For those who have lost mothers, especially if this is the, the first year of going through a Mother's Day without her, I pray for comfort. For those who have lost children, Lord, I pray that you would hold those, those women in your arms. Lord, for those who long to be mothers and are still awaiting, pray that you would give them hope and peace. Lord, be present this week. We pray all this in your mighty and powerful name, the name of our Jesus, and all God's people together said, amen. Amen. And uh, kiddos, you're dismissed to go back to Cuff Kids with Miss Patricia. Learn about our Savior and have fun with one another. For those of you remaining in the room, our scripture this morning is coming from the Gospel of John, chapter 16. So if you're turning there in your own Bible, I'll give you a few moments. We're going to read verses 16 through 22 together this morning. John 16, 16 through 22. All right, let's receive God's word for us this morning. Jesus went on to say, in a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. 
At this point, some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? And by saying, because I am going to the Father. They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come, but when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So also with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to Thanks God. Thanks be God. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Gracious and loving God, what a gift it is to come around your word together, to know that in it is contained truth, that, that you articulate for us who you are and your love for us and your son, Jesus Christ. So we pray, O oh God, that you would uh, move in this space, move amongst us, that we would hear you and know you all the more. Lord, open our eyes that we would see, our ears that we would hear, our minds that we would come to know and understand your word, our hearts that we would feel your power. Then in response, I ask that, O oh Lord, that you would open our hands, that we would offer grace to the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, some of you know my favorite sport is basketball. Both to watch and to play, if you were wondering. My favorite sport is basketball. And uh, I remember whenever I was in seminary, I was blessed to go to Candler School of Theology, Emory University. And while I was there, a dear friend of mine also was in the program. Uh, and his name is Dave Hobson. Dave Hobson also loves basketball. And so whenever we could find time to break away from our rigorous studying that was persistent and constant, we would go to the rec center and we would play basketball. Sometimes we would pick up with other teams, but most often we would just play ones. We'd play one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, Dave is a monster human. Uh, he is 6'3", and I won't guess his weight because uh, I don't remember, but it was a lot more than I was at the time. And so he would play bully ball. At the beginning of our time, we would play games to 15, and he would just back me down, back me down, back me down, lay up. And it was just embarrassing uh, how he would dominate me. But I have one thing going for me. I am annoying, and I don't give up. And so uh, he would win the first game. He'd say, you done? I'll run it back. And then the second game, run it back. Third game, run it back. And then eventually I would start winning because annoying matters in basketball. And all, actually, it's, it's persistence, persistence. And so I would keep fighting, keep fighting. And then I would start winning and winning and winning. And, and at the end of the day, we both had, had won and lost some games. And we began to wonder, why are we doing this? Why is it just, uh, you know, games to 15? Why don't we just keep score over the whole day? And so we would just say, all right, we're going to play until, you know, 45 minutes from now when we have to go, and we'll just, we'll just keep going. And then after a while, we realized, why are we binding ourselves in this way? We don't need to hold back. We actually just need to play an unlimited game for our entire time in Atlanta, Georgia. And so the game went on and on from the hundreds to the thousands to the ten thousands. And even in our old age, if we see each other, we can just say, hey, let's go. And we'll just keep the score running. You see, time is an interesting thing. We, we think that, that in a specific moment, uh, win or lose, uh, our feelings uh, and the way we're experiencing this moment should have power over us. But it doesn't have to. The game doesn't have to end. It can keep going. Whenever Jesus is interacting with his disciples here, he's at a critical point in his ministry. It is the day in which he is going to be betrayed. He is with his disciples and is walking from the upper room to the Mount of Olives. He has just washed his disciples' feet. 
He has just shared in Holy Communion with his disciples. And as he's walking to the Mount of Olives, where he will cry out to the Lord and ultimately be betrayed by Judas, on that journey, he has some things that he has to say. He must communicate with his disciples some critical lessons. And one of the things he shares with them is, is this it is this nuance of time and, and the framework in which we typically operate. And, and you might have heard it and you might have actually like droned on and maybe even dozed off as Zach was reading it because it was repeated thrice. Yes, I said thrice. A little while, you won't see me. A little while, you'll see me. And the disciples wondered. A little while, you'll see me. A little while, you won't see me. And Jesus realized that they were wondering. A little while, you won't see me. A little while, you'll see me. And so he addressed it with them. That's literally what we just read. I mean, it, it's, and, and the critical question seems to be, what does a little while mean? How long until we won't see? How long until we will see? Which then leans into maybe an even more potent question. How long will this grief last? How long must I sit in waiting and pain? How long must my suffering continue? And Jesus is pointing out that, that we box these things in, in, in the temporal, in the finite. And Jesus is, is trying to open our minds up to, to, to what is actually before us. That which is infinite. That which has been, is, and will be forevermore. He, he, he then classifies it in, in the opening of verse 20 in this way. He says, hey, I heard you thinking about this. A little while you won't see me. A little while you'll see me. Uh, let me break this down for you. And he, he talks about this single moment uh, in, in history that, that is a particular time-bound thing, but is also unleashed into a, 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 an, a, a, an experience that's applicable for all of human history. So this time-bound thing is this moment when the disciples will not see him. That's going to be a very difficult moment for them. For the last three years, the disciples have spent their lives with and devoted to Jesus. The, the, the work of the disciple is to, to literally let the dust of the rabbi's feet Feet cover them. It's, it's to walk in the shadow of the Savior. And they, they've, they've walked with him in times of great joy. They've witnessed miracles. They've heard teachings. And while they have walked, they have grown to have a deep love and abiding connection to him as not just their friend and the rabbi, but one that they call the Messiah. And through that clarity... One can only imagine what that time will be like that Jesus is talking about. That time without Jesus. Jesus says that that time, that there will be two different groups of people. There will be the, groups of, the group of people that, that follow Jesus. That, that have called upon his name. That understand him as the Messiah. That, that desire their lives to reflect his life and so those people he say will experience grief you will grieve jesus says in that time you will grieve but then he also says in that time there'll be another group of people a group of people that work in opposition to jesus that, that don't know jesus that don't believe he's the messiah and in that time those people will rejoice and so there's a specific moment where there's both grieving and rejoicing and it all depends on your relationship with jesus and then he he lays out for us that that there's this move this move from grief to joy for the disciples and it will happen in a little while whenever we realize that that time, that moment of grief does not have to persist or win the day, but rather it will be transformed into joy. 
if you have your Bibles out with you, I want you to turn to uh, verse 20, the second half of the verse, which uh, we call verse uh, 20b, uh, the second sentence. And I believe that this is uh, a critical turn that Jesus is inviting all of his disciples to fully adopt so that we will be uh, aware of what we are to do whenever we experience grief as well. Okay, in verse 20b, it says, you will grieve. I don't believe that's limited. It is a timeless a timeless reality that we all can relate to. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. I have in my Bible, like bold underline the word but and the word will. Because that's the kind of assurance I need so that whenever I grieve, whenever I experience pain or trauma, whenever I'm walking through the most difficult times in my life, I need to know that that does not have the final say. The end is not here. And so I could lean in and say, but Jesus, but Jesus says that my grief will be turning, transforming into joy. I, I love that that. that that will statement. It is not may language. It's not maybe or might. It's not possibly or I wonder if. There's no curiosity about it. Jesus is very clear that for his disciples, grief will turn to joy. Sometimes we think, we wonder, how long do I have to wait? We'll get to that in a moment but it will turn to joy. That word turn in the Greek, uh, I mean, uh, sometimes English and Greek just don't really work. And, uh, and there's a depth to that word turn in the Greek that, that Jesus, uh, it's so interesting how he uses it, uh, the double entendre. You know, we have some words with some double entendres. Well, in Greek they do as well. And this word turn also can mean transform, but it, it, its second layer depth is that that transformation takes place when something new is birthed, when something is born. And Jesus uses that uh, to build on the reference. He says, hey, this, this new thing that's born, hey, it's kind of like, and by the way, I believe here Jesus is as bold in his ministry as he is at any other point in time. As a man, Jesus attempts to articulate what childbirth is like. I think that's insane. So I'm going to walk tenderly and quickly through this because I am also not qualified to deal with this. I have witnessed this pain, but I am not qualified to articulate it. I'm just going to repeat what Jesus said here, okay? It will turn, it will birth a new thing, and here's what it's like. Child birthing is painful, I've heard. Quickly. And, um, and as it's painful, something happens in a moment as the new child is born. And as that birth takes place, immediately the pain begins to fade away. Not begins, does fade away. And joy has replaced it. It's as though the, the euphoria of life, new life, has moved and, and, and overwhelmed the pain, and it no longer has prominence there. That's what it's like when our grief will turn, birth a new thing in us, and it's joy. I love how John highlights some of Jesus' teaching, particularly around birth and new life, uh, this is a prominent image for him. You'll remember back to, to John chapter 3, just before John 3, 16, the familiar verse that, that has, uh, has resonated for generations for all of us. Just before that, Jesus is meeting with a, a gentleman named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is uh, curious. He is, uh, he's a Pharisee, and he wants to know more about what it means uh, to, to, to follow Jesus and understand his teachings. So he approaches and says, hey, I know you're, you're a teacher. I know you have power. Uh, there's something more here. Tell me about it. Tell me what it is. So in John chapter 3, verses 3 and following, here is this interaction with Nicodemus and Jesus. 
Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they're old, Nicodemus asked? Surely they cannot enter, the, enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Reasonable. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. This new birth that Jesus is talking about, this birth of water and the Spirit is one that, that comes for each of us as Christians, as disciples of Jesus Christ. We, when we are baptized by water and the Spirit, when we have the Spirit of God dwelling within us, what takes place in that space, in that time? It's, it's absolute transformation. Absolute transformation. It's as those scales fall from our eyes so that our interactions... Our relationships, our activities are no longer bound by the world's constraints. But now, what has been birthed is our engagement in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, which is here and now, in our midst, in our community, in our city, in our state, in our country, in the world, so that our interactions are now kingdom interactions. And our hope is not bound by that which can be defined or that which is fleeting in a moment, but rather we know that the kingdom is eternal. This is what is born in us. Now, you might be wondering, Pastor Jason, that's great. I believe all that. But I still have grief, even as a Christian. I've still had suffering, which is why I believe Jesus is describing for his disciples this thing that is in that single moment and the thing that is true forevermore for us. Jesus is offering us a promise. He's saying you will grieve, but it will turn. It will, it will be transformed. New birth is yours, and there is joy. That is the ultimate outcome for us. About a decade ago, there was a, a mentor pastor of mine who received uh, horrible news. His wife, his beloved wife, had been diagnosed with cancer. And there were questions about her life expectancy, but it was known that she would suffer through uh, aggressive treatment in order to address this cancer. And he stood up before the congregation after receiving this news, and he confessed that he was in pain. That he was experiencing grief, and he was experiencing suffering, and he was even, he, he confessed, experiencing some anger. Some anger with God and some wondering, how am I going to walk through this? And so he shared, hey, this is a church of some size. We have some associates. So for a period of time, the associates are going to take the lead on Sundays. I'm going to wrestle and work with God through this. I don't know how long I'll be out, he said. But I'm going to be out because I have to walk in the midst of my grief. I thought that was unbelievably humble, honest, transparent. I mean, for him to share that with his church, I thought was really powerful. But what was even more powerful was what he shared on the first Sunday he came back. He shared with his church this very passage. He shared, no one can take away my joy. I walked with the Lord. I wrestled with the Lord. I was honest with my suffering with the Lord. And from that place and position, I was able to receive the power, the working of the Holy Spirit, anew, afresh in me. And I was born into joy. To God be the glory, his wife 
uh, survived and is cancer free. But he gave that testimony before she was healed. Because his joy was not conditional. It was unconditional. What is it for us to walk in that as well, for us to receive this promise from God, to know that in those spaces of pain and trauma, we can call on the Lord and He will always answer. That, that, that little while that we believe uh, the suffering is persisting, it, 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 need, it needs to be shut down by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, by us calling on Jesus. And He says, I will answer definitively. Absolutely, I will answer. I was blessed uh, by my, my senior pastor whenever I was in seminary to be sent on a mission trip to Kenya. It was the first time I ever went to a developing country, and I was wide-eyed. If you've ever been to a developing country, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. For those of you that haven't, I encourage you to go because it is startling. And the first few days while we were on that trip, all I could do was see poverty. I was struck by it. The struggle of day-to-day -day life to attempt to try to make ends meet so that they could survive. That was my vision of the people of Kenya. Until the third day in on our trip, it was a Sunday morning. We were on the Masai Mara out in a village uh, in uh, what would otherwise be known as the middle of nowhere. And uh, we came to uh, a gathering outside in the field that was worship. And my frame of reference was drastically transformed because I witnessed more joy in and amongst the people of God in that service of worship than I had in any other setting and have in any other setting since. There was joy in the singing. There was joy in the preaching. There was joy in the offering. There was joy in all of it and I had to think to myself, what has the power to turn, to birth this new thing in and amongst a people that otherwise should be grieving in their suffering? What has that power but Jesus? What has that power but the Lord himself who blesses each and every one of his disciples with the indwelling working of the Spirit of God so that their frame of reference, like our frame of reference, is now kingdom-oriented. So I know many of us, maybe even today, are in the midst of grief and pain. If that is where you find yourself today or in the days to come, I invite you to lean in to this grand promise from Jesus in John chapter 16. He says, you will grieve. But your grief will be turned to joy. When you call on me, I will be there. Each and every time. This is a never failing truth and promise we have in God. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we come to you recalling times in our lives when we felt empty and alone when we felt like we were walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And so we call upon your name, recalling those moments or maybe even encountering them here today in this very time. We pray, oh God, we pray that you would, that you would transform our grief into joy, that we would fear no evil, but acknowledge that you are with us. 
You are with us as comforter and guide, one in whom we can place our hope. And in that hope, we are just filled with joy. That it is a, a reservoir that is filled by a never-ending spring, spring that flows from life, life we have in you. And so reframe our expectations, God, so that, that as we enter into grief and suffering, we know that it will not last, but it goes on and it's transformed into joy that is ours in you. Lord, we trust in you and we trust in your word. We trust in that truth. Lord, as we continue in worship and we offer a portion of what you have blessed us with to the kingdom building work of your church, Lord, we ask that you would bless this time, that you would be glorified in our offerings and that you would be glorified in the way the church uses the, these resources to bless the community and the world. We thank you, O oh God, for these gifts. We return them to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would the ushers come forward for this morning's offering? Joy, joy, joy has stolen my heart. Joy, joy, joy in you. Joy, 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 you've captured my high heart. Fill this place and show us something new. Joy, joy, joy has stolen. and show us more of you. Church, Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him. All who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us take a few moments in silent prayer to confess our sin before God. This is the good news. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. It is a right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity and made covenant to be our sovereign God and spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Us is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce the time had come when you would save your people. Jesus healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. And by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You, uh, you delivered us and then made a, with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always by the power of his word and Holy Spirit. 
on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, and he broke the bread. And he turned to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given, broken for you. As often as you gather together, do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. Again, he gave thanks to you. And he turned to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood. It's the blood of the new covenant. It's poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we together proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. So we ask, oh God, that if you would pour out your Holy Spirit on these, your gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood, by your spirit. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast together at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, both now and forevermore. Amen. And now we join together as sisters and brothers in Christ, praying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would those who are assisting come forward at this time? This morning, as we receive the sacrament of Holy Communion, you will approach by direction of the ushers to one of three stations. If you come with one hand held open, you'll receive a, a cup that has a wafer and the juice in it. Uh, you could receive that by twisting off one at a time. If you come with two hands held open, you'll receive a piece of bread and you'll receive a cup with juice in it. All of this is God's gift as the body and blood for us. If you would like to receive the sacrament gluten-free, the station to, the, to your left of the altar will host that. The kneelers are open for prayers for each of you to meet with the Lord. This is not Covenant's table. This is not a United Methodist table. This is the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. As it's his table, each and every one of us are invited and welcome to come. All has been prepared. Would you come at this time?
fails us, that even if there is grief, there is joy in the morning, and we praise you for that, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I do invite you after worship uh, to go to the, uh, to the art rendering for the Boundless Campaign. Answer that question. Complete that sentence. I'm thankful to God for my church because there are Sharpies there. I hope that you'll take part in that. Receive this benediction. Lord, we go forth from this place filled with your joy, knowing that you have transformed the way in which we engage in and experience the world. Lord, use us as your servants in the world to be ministers of joy to all we encounter. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Peace be with you, brothers and sisters.